Hello, I'm Olu Adjilori, a Professor of Psychiatry at the University of Illinois in Chicago. And today I'll be talking about um, the topic of what do our machines know about mental health disparities that we don't. Uh, here are my disclosures. Uh, some of the work that I'm gonna be talking about today has been commercialized in a company I co-founded called Keywise AI. So what's one of the biggest problems that we're facing in mental health today? It's access. And this is something that I've noticed as the director of the Mood and Anxiety Disorder Program at the University of Illinois, where I oversee an interdisciplinary team of clinicians, social workers, APRNs, psychiatrists, psychologists, who deliver both inpatient and outpatient services. And our current wait time to see a psychiatrist for medication management is about six weeks. But for cognitive behavioral therapy, our wait times are anywhere between eight to 12 months. And so this is a big problem with access. Um, and these problems are uh, worse with folks that really need it. So here we see from data from the National Alliance for the Mentally Ill that out of all the adults in the US with a mental illness, only 45% actually get treatment within a given year. And these numbers are worth, worse for minorities. So for example, 23% of Asian adults with mental illness actually receive treatment and 33% of adults who are black with mental illness receive treatment. And these disparities are not explained um, by either clinical appropriateness or need or even patient preference. As you're seeing here are the rates of access to care by different race and ethnicity groups. And you can see that um, Hispanics, African-Americans and Asians are receiving um, less access compared to their white counterparts in, uh, who are seeking treatment for mental health care. Um, in addition, those who do seek treatment can be misdiagnosed. Um, this was well recognized even back in the late 70s and early 80s in this paper from Dr. Carl Bell, Carl Bell, where they talked about the misdiagnosis of black patients with manic depressive illness or bipolar disorder. And these um, disparities still exist today. Here's a recent study from Steve Strakowski and colleagues showing that among patients um, with different disorders, black patients with schizophrenia are more likely to screen positive for depression. In addition, the biggest predictor for screening positive for depression, uh, having been diagnosed with schizophrenia, was also being uh, Black. So Black patients with schizophrenia are often missed in terms of their mood disorder diagnosis. So the problem is, is that there are significant mental health disparities that exist uh, for racial and ethnic minorities when it comes to access to care but also in terms of getting an accurate diagnosis. So how can technology help to reduce these disparities? Well, one way is if we can develop more bias-free methods of assessment, we might have more accurate diagnoses that aren't subject to some of these uh, implicit or even explicit biases. And that's some of the work that we're doing as part of the study called Unmask or Unobtrusive Monitoring of Affective Symptoms and Cognition Using Keyboard Dynamics. And this is a study to see if we can look at brain correlates of cognitive dysfunction in mood disorders and link them to how we interact uh, with the network of devices that we use on a day-to-day -day basis, like smartphones and smartwatches. And we're using an app called BioEffect, developed by my colleague, Dr. Alex Leal, pictured here, which replaces the default keyboard of your smartphone with a customized keyboard that allows us to track how you type on your phone. So we can look at things like how fast you're typing, whether you make mistakes when you type the rhythm of your typing and infer information about mood and cognition that's passive and unobtrusive in a way that's passive and unobtrusive. And we were fortunate to partner with the University of Michigan and doctors Kelly Ryan and Melvin McInnes who are running the Prechter Longitudinal Study for Bipolar Disorder we were able to get pilot data from a sample of these subjects that used a BiEffect enabled Android smartphone. They also did daily ecological momentary assessment ratings of mood, impulsivity, energy, and rapid thinking. And they also received clinician rated scales for depression, the Hamilton rating scale for depression and mania, the young mania rating scale. And in one of our first papers published from this collaboration, Dr. John Zulueta shown here, showed that we can use these typing metrics to significantly predict 
ratings of mania and clinician rated scales of depression. And when looking at what were the unique typing features for depression and mania, what he found was that less backspace usage on the keyboard was associated with more manic symptoms and more typos or autocorrect flags were associated with more depressive symptoms. In another study, we wanted to see if we can use the typing data to prospectively predict changes in depression symptoms. And this is work published by our colleague, Dr. Jonathan Stange, shown here, where he looked at the instability of the mood ratings done by Ecological Momentary Assessment, or EMA, and the instability of typing speed, and to see if we could use the instability of mood rating and typing speed to prospectively predict elevations in depressive symptoms controlling for baseline symptoms. And what he found was indeed that both instability or the irregularity of the mood ratings predicted future depression levels, but also importantly, instability of daily typing speed also predicted future depressive levels. We were fortunate in that these subjects, in addition to getting the clinician rated scales for their mood symptoms, they also did a neuropsychological battery, which allows us to look at cognition. And they did the trail making test, part A and part B, and the Tower of London task. And we wanted to know if these typing metrics could be used to passively assess cognitive function in addition to mood. This is the trail making test, which is basically a connect the dots task. Uh, part A involves uh, connecting numbers sequentially, and part B involves letter number sequencing. So it also involves executive function in addition to processing speed. And this is work published by our graduate student, Mindy Ross. Uh, the participants did the trail making test twice a day. So she looked at key presses that were done in the morning and associated those with the morning trail making test versus those that were done in the evening and compared that uh, to the evening trail making test. She controlled for a number of uh, covariates like time of day, um, the number of times they have done the test in the past. And what she found was really interesting that typing speed was highly correlated with speed of performance on the trail making test between subjects. So subjects that did the task slower also type slower. But more interestingly, she found that within subject that there was an association between typing speed and performance on the trail making test. So that if any given individual types slower on that day, they also perform slowly, more slowly on the trail making test. So we see that typing speed was highly correlated with processing speed and executive function. We've also taken a dynamical systems approach to looking at the typing data. And this is uh, a technique borrowed from other types of analyses that have looked at sample entropy in EEG data or EMG data, heart rate variability, or postural sway in the case of Parkinson's disease, where we can look at the regularity or irregularity of the time series uh, captured from the typing data. And this is how we characterize the typing data as a time series. What you're looking at here in the x-axis is the order of the key presses as a function of how fast that key is pressed shown on the y-axis. And so we have this key press data shown here as a time series, and we can look at the regularity or irregularity of this time series to look at the dynamics. And we did this in the Tower of London task, which is um, a cognitive task where you have these balls on a peg, and the idea is to get from this start state to a goal state in as few moves as possible. And this is work done by our colleagues, Dr. Alex Demos and John Bark, where we wanted to look at how long it takes to do each move on this task and to see if there was irregularity or regularity in the timing of the moves on this task. Um, and we cap used entropy to capture this regularity. So a low entropy signal from this data would mean a highly regular time series so that each time between each move is relatively uh, the same versus a high entropy or irregular time series where each move time is very different from another. And the idea is that if you are doing this task impulsively, you might have a short first move time, realize you messed up and have a longer second move time. Whereas if you've done this task and planned out how you're gonna solve it, you're gonna have more regular move times. We also compare this to the times in between key presses. Again, a low entropy signal, which would mean a highly regular typing uh, cadence, 
And then a high entropy signal would be more irregular times in between each key press. Each key press. And our hypothesis is that if the move times on the Tower of London task are reflective of this impulsivity or poor planning, then participants with bipolar disorder, which have higher levels of impulsivity, would have higher levels of entropy on their move times on this task, and that this might be correlated with the entropy of their typing. And indeed, that's what they found, that in the Tower of London task, bipolar subjects had higher levels of entropy compared to controls. And then using multi-scale entropy, which looks at the entropy across different time scales, shown here on the x-axis, across all time scales, participants with bipolar disorder had higher levels of typing entropy compared to controls. Furthermore, that typing entropy in participants with bipolar disorder was highly correlated with the move times on the Tower of London task entropy and was also associated with variability in depressive symptoms as measured by the Hamilton rating scale for depression and variability in impulsive actions and feelings. So the pilot study shows that we can use the, the smartphone keyboard dynamics to look at elevations in mood symptoms as well as cognitive dysfunction in bipolar disorder. So what we're doing now in the MAS study is to see if these abnormalities that we detect with the keyboard translate to alterations in brain network correlates of cognitive dysfunction in patients with mood disorders. So after doing a baseline assessment, we're having participants use BioEffect for two weeks, then they get a MRI scan to look at these brain network correlates, as well as clinician rated scales of their mood and cognitive performance. And then the whole process is repeated for another two weeks. And our hypothesis is that things like typing speed, which I've shown you are associated with processing speed, would be also associated with brain network correlates of cognitive dysfunction, like uh, brain network efficiency. And our hope is that we can use these um, passively unobtrusive methods of detecting mood and cognitive performance in a bias-free manner that gets away from some of the um, disparities that we see in how folks are diagnosed. Another way that we can use technology to reduce these disparities is to develop digital interventions with key stakeholder engagement. And there was a paper published uh, last year that described a framework for how this can be done called REACT, where they talk about the incorporation of real world um, evidence, properly educating both providers and consumers, and then coming up with interventions that are adaptive uh, to specific and diverse populations, as well as building trust within the community where we want to deploy these digital behavioral interventions. And this is the approach that we've taken in another study called SPEAK, or the study of a problem-solving therapy trained voice-enabled artificial intelligence counselor that we're using in patients with mild to moderate depression and or anxiety. And this is a app that works on the Alexa uh, platform uh, for natural language processing and natural language understanding to deliver problem-solving therapy. We've also integrated um, this Alexa-based platform uh, with um, ecological momentary assessments and surveys that are done uh, via smartphone or tablet. And it delivers 12 sessions, uh, sorry, eight sessions over 12 weeks. And to design um, this intervention, we used a formative and inclusive process um, that involved uh, testing out the app called Lumen with participants um, after two sessions. We did several surveys like the user experience questionnaire, um, the NASA task load index, and the working alliance inventory um, for technology. And we used it in a very diverse sample of folks that um, the majority of whom had experience with in-person problem solving therapy. But you can see that the majority of participants were actually non-white with a good um, rep a majority representation of women. And we did semi-structured interviews with them as well um, that revealed a lot of themes uh, that were uh, utilized in the redevelopment of our app called Lumen. Um, we got feedback, for example, that when people were going through the sessions, they might've felt rushed and didn't have enough time to think through things or write things down. And we considered that a high temporal load of using the app. Um, other suggestions were to have a binder um, inside the app that would allow people to track their progress. 
Um, another example was that people found that it was difficult to engage sometime and there were breakdowns in communication with the app, um, maybe due to accent issues or pronunciation issues. So some of the lessons that we learned and, and how we decided to incorporate these lessons in the new version of the app were to reduce temporal and cognitive load by breaking down the conversational segments into um, easier to digest uh, portions. We also added repeat, pause, and resume functions to give the user more control over the interaction and to reduce the temporal load. And then we also provided a, both a physical and a digital workbook to accompany Lumen so participants could track their progress through each session. Um, and that was in, also included feedback on how they did on the various uh, surveys and mood rating scales. And here's the overall design of the study. Um, after recruitment and an orientation, we had participants do baseline surveys that included the Penn State Worry Questionnaire, um, the Positive and Negative Affect Scale, Problem Solving Scale, and Dysfunctional Attitude Scale. They also had an MRI scan um, to look at both the uh, cognitive uh, control circuit, which uh, is involved in problem solving therapy, and the negative affect circuit, which involved brain regions that respond to negative stimuli. And they were randomized to getting Lumen treatment, um, uh, the eight sessions over 12 weeks, or a waitlist control. Um, and uh, I, I'm, we're still working through the data, but some of our preliminary results suggest that the intervention compared to control led to reductions uh, in depression and anxiety symptoms. And what was really fascinating is that it seemed to work best for non-white women with less than a college de degree of education who also had low digital health literacy. And while we're still analyzing the data, we think that's because of the um, inclusive process that went into the design of Lumen that incorporated input from diverse populations. Um, and this is something that we're seeing in other work done here at uh, the University of Illinois. Uh, here pictured is Dr. Jenna Duffesey and Dr. Pauline Mackey. They've developed an online um, cognitive behavioral therapy app for women with postpartum depression. Um, and what it's done is it's increased access to care, particularly for black women um, in the Chicago area by reducing stigma and increasing access. So, um, what I hope came out of my presentation was the idea that we can use digital mental health technologies um, for assessment and treatment uh, in ways that might address some of the mental health disparities that exist in our field. And it's really important to include key stakeholders and more diverse participants in our research studies and the design of these digital interventions um, to better address these disparities. So I'd like to end by thanking my colleagues both on the SPEAK project, which is co-led by Dr. June Ma, uh, as well as the BioEffect project with Unmask, uh, co-led doc with Dr. Alex Liao. Thank you very much for your attention. Mm -hmm.